Hi, and welcome to Power of 10, a podcast about design operating at many levels, zooming out from thoughtful detail through to organizational transformation and onto changes in society and the world. My name is Andy Pallain. I'm a service design and innovation consultant, design leadership coach, educator, and writer. My guest today is Seb Chan, Chief Experience Officer at ACME, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image in Melbourne. He champions human-centred design approaches across the museum, and prior to ACME, he led the digital renewal transformation of the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York, and the Powerhouse Museum's pioneering work in open access, mass collaboration, and digital experience during the 2000s. He's also adjunct professor at the School of Media and Communications in the College of Design and Social Context at RMIT in Melbourne. Seb, welcome to the show. Hi, uh, really great to be here. You've had quite a journey from Australia to New York and, and back again uh, in some pretty major um, public galleries and museums. Tell us a little bit about your... We think it was sort of back in the music scene in Australia, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of fell into museums and the cultural sector sort of at the end of the 1990s. And I was really doing a lot of work and play in music, running events and clubs and mm. parties and DJing and really part of the, I guess, that hybrid of the, ele- the electronic music scene in Sid- Sydney and the emergent web people making things on the web and, you know, all, all that sort of buzz before the dot-com crash um, in Sydney. And I guess for me, you know, I, I fell into museums much as a lot of people of my era fell into technology and design by being in the right place with the right right people just at a particular moment where the web as a medium was something that was not fully commercial, but there was ways to make a living from it. And I think coming into the Powerhouse Museum through the IT side, in fact, really on the off kind of chance of applying for a job, I ended up bringing together a lot of the skills and thinking that I'd brought up. You know, when I look back on it, I kind of approach museums as I used to approach DJing as a (laughs) practice. So it's sort of like this notion of, you know, for, for me, the ideal museum is one that introduces people to ideas, culture, experiences, media, items that they didn't think they would be interested in, much as a really good DJ does an amazing set that gets people to dance and move and socialise to music they have never heard and don't know. And Mm. so it's that sort of contextual piece around can you, for, for me it's been about, can you design spaces that bring people together around ideas and cultural objects that they are not familiar with and get them vibing on that, yeah, you know? And yeah. I think that's been part of what I've been trying to do in various ways and tech has intersected with that. So you wrote this piece uh, a little while ago, it was like December, I think, last year. It said, looking backwards to go forwards, you know, from words to talks in late 2020. And <laughs> you started with this slide that says this site best viewed at resolutions greater than 640 by 480 and you know as you went through it i mean partly i I kind of felt really old because i was reading through going oh yeah i remember that i remember that because you're kind of talking about um you know how technology was introduced to museums in terms of well in interactive art i mean my the anti-rum stuff Mm. that i was involved in in the early 90s you know putting that in a museum it certainly wasn't the first technology. You know, there was stuff in the late 60s and 70s in museums. And I mm. think you, you you quote someone actually talking about, you know, in the 1970s saying, is this stuff going to be still, you know, playable in the, in the you know, uh, 2000s? You know, and, and it was incredibly fraught because, you know, whose machine went in the museum? Was it, you know, did the machine, was it part of the artwork or was it just the CD-ROM in our case and all that kind of stuff? And, of course, it runs at different speeds and then the things break and, and all of that. Well, can you maybe, I know it's, it's quite a long article and it's very worth a read and I'll put it in the show notes, but, you know, what was the, what was the kind of thinking behind that and what's the sort of through line of, of, of that piece? Yeah, look, I guess it, it, it pulled on a number of threads that I think had started to unravel during the during COVID. And I think the sort of 
period, particularly in the museum sector, being uh, somewhere somewhere between it and not for profit and government supported sector, mm. depending on what part of the world you're in, the memory of museum practice really lives on in in the staff who are retained. And over the last year and a half, or two years, we've had a lot of people leaving the field, particularly in the US and the UK mm. and Europe, less so in Australia. Um, and with them goes a huge amount of knowledge and, and a huge amount of context that begins to explain some of the reasons why that non-profit technology or technology and design in the not-for-profit space is so fraught. And I think I like to tie it back also to the way that museums now need to be collecting and preserving things that, like your CD-ROM mm. art or, you know, we have here at Melbourne, the archives of Stella, mm, and mm. we have you know, new commissioned works that we've commissioned in the last couple of kind of years, v- virtual reality works, AR works, AI, gen- you know, generative documentaries, works that are, that arrive on a, on a lacy orange drive mm. that's going to last five years. And that is the work. Mm. And that hard kind of drive needs much more active preservation practices than a painting. Or a sculpture. Yeah. Um, and so there's that digital preservation piece, but then this practice piece. And so a lot of the history of technologies in museums has been poorly preserved. And also um, a lot of the things that I, I and my teams built at the powerhouse in the early 2000s have been lost or, you know, run in very old uh, versions of Flash and the, mm. the, the original files are gone or director. These sorts of things. But as soon as you get to um, social web and all of this sort of networked culture piece uh, from the mid kind of 2000s onwards, even pres- what what kind of you preserve is even more fraught because it's the social context yeah. that matters more. And we're going through this around video game preservation at kind of the moment as well. Yeah. But, you know, sort of lots of things in this. And I guess I'd seen a lot of people... Um, coming back to address some of the fundamental challenges in museum technology uh, and not-for-profit technology, which is how is it maintained yeah. and how do we grow things on top of the things we have built when most of the financing for it is project-based, so you'll get a grant for three mm-hmm. years and after three years the grant ends and the project sort of lives in this sort of stasis, stasis and then it sort of fades away mm-hmm. and... All the memory around that's lost, it's probably poorly documented, all of those things. So, so the last decade of my team's work have really been about, in both New York and here in Melbourne, has been about building different infrastructure. And I, I, I like to sort of think about it as we're trying to build gardens of technology mm. now to support an ecosystem, but builds in that sense of it needs gardeners from the very, very beginning. So it's not, so, so maintenance is part of it by design. And I think that uh, plays out a lot in government tech too. Yeah. You know, I think it's challenging, but it's, it, museum space is weird because it's this hybrid of it's, it's not, you know, when people talk about service kind of um, mm-hmm. design in the museum and, 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 and users in the museum, a museum experience isn't a transactional experience mm. or shouldn't be a transactional experience. So some of the, some of the practices that you might apply from um, other design fields yeah. um, or, or sub sort of di- disciplines don't neatly match. Well, in a service design perspective, you know, I guess the the front stage is is actually the most sort of ephemeral thing, right? It's just a kind of, you're only, mm. a, a, any exhibit or any, ex, you know, exhibition is only a kind of a brief sort of poking through of, of the backstage work that museums do, you know? Yeah. I mean, and famously, even in sort of natural history museums, there are kind of drawers of fossils that no one's seen and you still get these kind of stories that come out of someone's kind of digging around a, a, a drawer that hadn't been open for you know 50 years and discovered something yeah you know it's interesting hearing you speaking for two reasons one there's like a kind of museum ops i don't know if that's a thing but it sounds like kind of part of what you're talking about <laughs> oh, is, is. <laughs> is um you know is museum ops has it been coined that phrase in that way already uh, to, to a degree yeah and i think mm. what museum ops means has also technologized yeah. for one of a better yeah. word that the, the museum operations technology is just mm. part of the infrastructure now. Mm. It is the building. Yeah, well, that's the thing you also wrote in your article before and your Medium post with, you know, you, technology used to be optional in museums. 
And in fact, it used to be yeah. so optional that it was a, massive, a bit of a pain in the ass to even kind of get it in there, right? You know, the yeah. basic stuff like there weren't sort of power outlets or or kind of networking yeah. and things like yeah. that. Yeah. You know, but the, <laughs> the regular listeners will know that my my heart was singing as you were talking about gardens and ecosystems because it's my my big kind of metaphor that I love. And the thing I often talk about with services, and this is you know exactly this, is that they're landscape gardens, right? That you are. Mm. Um, working on something or putting something together that will will outlive you you know it's a humbling thought mm. certainly some of the stuff that even the tech you know some of the stuff that um you're you're working on now you know if the museum is doing its job properly it's going to be around for in the next 50 or 100 years and that's a kind of you know impossible time scale to imagine in the days of you know what is it kind of yearly software you know platform os upgrades and all the rest of it yeah you know and I, I remember a while ago, and it was actually because someone was interested in, in um, well, it was because I was sort of slightly involved in this world, but also because someone was interested in trying to get anti-ROM to run, sort of art CD-ROM that kind of, I guess, launched my and a group of us, our careers. I still keep a, an old laptop around because I got an old Mac laptop that runs OS 8, I think, and it, it still runs on there, and I can still plug it into a projector if it has VGA. And otherwise, I can't run that anymore. But at some point, those all those things have moving parts, and they will fall apart. And I, I, I don't know if this has yet been resolved. But I, at the time, there was a big kind of debate around sort of curation and preservation, almost that like those two kind of things in in hmm. opposition to each other or intention. In that, you know, do you run something on an emulator, and is that then the authentic real experience? Because you're not really do you need to have an old 644 or 80 monitor to watch it on because that's actually how it was experienced? And of course, then the other thing with things like CD-ROMs is they ran differently on everyone's machines anyway. So, you know, what is the authentic experience? There's a bit of Sir Walter Benjamin, I think, coming in there. Is all that stuff still an issue or is it sort of less so now? It, it, it's it's changing. I think, you know, when I was at the Cooper Hewitt for the Smithsonian, my team and I collected... Mm. Um, the data visualization from Bloom Interactive mm. um, uh, Planetary. So it was one of mm. the first apps on kind of the iPad and was using the iPad as a visualizer for your music collection as a series of uh, planetary systems. And it was a beautiful metaphor for many things. But of course, by the time we came around to collecting it for the design museum, you know, this, this notion was, well, well, what is it? It doesn't run on the latest version of iOS. So it's already defunct. Mm. Um, and then we worked with, uh, Tom McCartan and Ben kind of Servany and others who were part of Bloom at kind of the time. And the Smithsonian actually, the software was what, what was acquired. And then we opened kind of sourced the software with Bloom to release it for preservation purposes. And in that process, it was really about saying what we were collecting wasn't the instance of it as an app from 2010. It mm. was the idea and the idea of uh, interactive data visualization as a nested series of, of uh, solar system, planet and moon with orbits that have differing lengths mm. could be ported to other contexts. And that's what was interesting about it. So the software preservation piece was about preserving the GitHub repository. And then that would then be in the future ported. So two years ago now, uh, or one and a half, two years ago, a software developer in Sydney discovered this of all places and ported it to the latest version of iOS uh, because it was open source. Right. And now that's part of the preservation has been lived through the open sourcing of that. The flip side of that is, you know, we're, we're involved in two Australian Research Council linkage projects uh, in, in Melbourne now with Swinburne University and others. One of them is on preserving video game, Australian video games of the 1990s. So that era just before mass scale networked video game mm, play. So yeah, these yeah. were still solitary pieces, a bit uh, like, you know, the anti-ROM works. Yeah. So emulation and emulation as a service. So can we provide access to these games for research purposes and mm -hmm. experiential purposes with emulation? How much fidelity do they have to the, in quotes, the originals? Mm. But also then what is the, what's been the influence and cultural practices around those? And the second one is around Australian media archives. Mm -hmm. So the archives of Deluxe Media Arts in Sydney, Experimenta, Anat. There's amazing Australian media art that, that, that is sitting in these different collections 
private and public collections that needs ways, different ways of accessing them. And the technology to access them is almost as fragile as the works yeah, themselves. Yeah. And and it does raise that question of what is the work and what is the purpose of the work. So I think we started in the field to move away from the notion of buy up all the Sony Trinitron monitors while you could because this is only the authentic work if it's running on right, a Trinitron right. monitor. We've moved away from that and hardware preservation too is a you know fool's errand at the end of the time. There will be yeah, a yeah. time where a Commodore 64 just will not work anymore. Mm. I mean, that, that very stable and people, you know, people make music from the SID uh, chips. But really, you know, do you really need the original one now? Yeah. But there are some things about the interfaces that I think are interesting. I think uh, Nick Monfort uh, from MIT did this really interesting piece on the Commodore 64. And this, he came and spoke at the powerhouse. And, you know, when I was there, when we were doing an exhibition on the 1980s and Nick came out and he was saying, there's something very specific about the Commodore 64 physical keyboard mm. that is different in kind of the emulator. So you had those little characters on the keyboard that you hold down the Commodore key. Yeah, yeah, it's like the ZX Spectrum too. And yeah, yeah, and you got those little things and you don't see those when you use the keyboard of any other computer on an emulator. So there are some of those um, uh, graphical tricks that you can't, easily see how they are done and i think that's that that really mm. for me spoke to what are the specificities of the physical things versus what is done in software and i think that's yeah. so sort of teasing out the affordances of the originals is is something that you know people who are curating and preserving this sort of stuff are starting yeah. to really look at so what are the specific the specificity of the mediums, I guess. Yeah, yeah. The, C, the C64 is a medium and interface, not just, it's a platform. Well, it's more than that. Yeah. I mean, we had this thing, you know, well, it's interesting. I, I guess I was thinking also back to, you know, those art pieces. I think, it's, is it boys? Who, who did the kind of artist's breath in a balloon as a piece of art? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots, of, lots of conceptual art too. Like, like what is the work? I said, yeah, that's a conceptual art, yeah. Yeah, and so you end up kind of looking at the, the piece of work and it's obviously, it's now a kind of dried up old latex balloon in a kind of glass vitrine. And that one, yeah. there's no artist's breath left in there anyway and stuff. And those are conceptual art works. And I wonder if there's a, I guess there's a sort of similarity there in which what you're really looking at is the idea, yeah. you know, and it's kind of not terribly interesting looking at the original. I think the the thing for talking as, you know, as somebody who was involved in making an art piece back then, you know, we, when we made Antiron, one of the things we were spent a lot of time on was trying to get more color out of the range out of the computer than we did so yeah. for those kids who don't remember our computers <laughs> used to have yeah, it used to be an 8-bit or 16-bit used to have 256 yeah. colors or used to have thousands of colors and we used to make a thing called a, a clut a color lookup table so that you could say okay out of all of those you could change the the range of those colors you still only had those kind of um, thousands of colors we spent a lot of time working on that stuff mm. and switching between 8 and 16-bit and because it was you know all about some memory efficiencies and all of that kind of stuff mm. And one of the the upshots of that was when we switched between you know bitmap graphics and QuickTime movies, we had a little they were called X objects in Director that used to change the color depth of the monitor, and of course the monitor used to flash as we mm. it did it. That was a, mm. that was a bug, and so what we did was decided well we're going to kind of lean into that. We had a kind of folder full of these little sound hits, you know stuff we'd got off kind of sound libraries like you know orchestra stabs or kind of smashing sounds or explosions or whatever so when it made that noise when it did the switch the monitor color switch uh, it looked like it was intended right because we it made a sound and what i've noticed is it crashes emulators because they're, yeah. they're yeah. not kind of set up to kind of think that way so it's this weird thing which was a an accident of the medium at the time or of a limitation of the medium at the time that we turned into kind of part of the work only really to hide the problem that sort of then became actually part of the experience which now doesn't work anymore, you know, and, and I don't know, you know, my, my, the me from back then, the kind of 20 something me would say, oh God, if it can run on a kind of larger monitor in kind of millions of colors, yeah, do it. You know, that's exactly what mm. we want. But the me now is kind of looks back on that stuff and it definitely is part of the, it's part of the work, right? It's part of the charm, I was going to say, but that's a bit twee, but I actually think it's part of the, 
it's part of capturing what it was at the time, I think, that is the, it. the yeah. kind of crucial bit. Yeah, it's sort of pointing at the limitations that you were working with, yeah. C64 and raster interrupts and all, yeah. you know, all those things. Um, and, and, and I'd say in music too, I mean, a, a lot of these sort of things I map back to. Also, I guess at my age too, we look nostalgically back at, you know, the great raves of yeah. years past. What what does it mean to recapture that, and 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 how does that performance and, mm. and that experiential piece get imprinted on memory, and how does how does a museum? Yeah. I mean, what is a museum of a great nightclub, like yeah, like yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. I you know, or Jamaican sound systems, or whatever yeah, yeah. you want to do. Like, how do you capture that? Well, you can't. It's the no, same as capturing a, a theatre performance. There's something yeah. different. When you see it on a recording or stream, and, and we've seen this in COVID yeah. too, that's yeah, yeah. the 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 medium. There's a transformation there, there a and transformation. I think what, yeah. it's it's an interesting one that is one of those things that I like to poke at. You know, I think yeah. that's that's one of the luxuries of working in the museum space is that ability to sort of play with all this stuff, but also have a public. You know, there, mm. there's that public interface, which is it's very exciting. I think, you know, there's this serious, um, I think it's an Apple TV thing actually from um, Mark Ronson. It's called Watch the Sound. And he's sort of going through oh, all yeah, kind yeah. of different things. Yeah. It's really, really good. Um, and there's a bit where he's going, you know, it's a bit about synthesizers. E each one's are like synthesizers, reverb, distortion, and kind of different things. He starts with auto tune, which kind of I slightly changed my opinion of auto tune, but not much. But the, the synthesizer one, of course, you know, you get that thing with people pulling out of this old synth and that they still use because they're just there because exactly everything you're saying it's got something about the sound of it and the controls of it and the, it's you know it literally is the circuitry inside it plus the way you can control it with the yeah. the particular physical interface of it that yeah. is still not matched by you know obviously there are digital plugins that exactly kind of duplicate the sound but kind of don't duplicate the the sort of anomalies, I guess, or the of mm. performing on it with a kind of physical thing. Mm. And I guess there is kind of some similarities there, but I felt like one of the, do you see it as part of the job of the museum to bring that part forward? The, you, know, you said this thing about the, you know, the technology is like a kind of transformation. Well, there's a transformation that goes on with the, the technology, the sort of viewing technology which transforms the kind of content. Medium is the message, right? And I, mm. is there, is that part of the museum's, mandate do you see or um to make that thing we will consume so much media we will consume so much stuff without really thinking about how it is transformed through you know by the whatever device we're looking at it on is it part of the kind of goal of say acme to say hey you know this this process is going on and you might not be you know aware of it and this is what it means yes certainly for me it's very important i mean you know all the museums, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in the notion of everything as, as, a, as a designed object or experience. So I'm, mm. I'm very interested in, in the design of media. So, so process of making is something mm. that, that the museum really focuses on now. And I'm also very interested, and, and this has different, plays out in different ways with different exhibitions and, and how other people think about things, but I, I am very interested personally in drawing attention to how how you as a museum goer might be transformed by what you have seen. Mm -hmm. And so you go and look at it or play it, if it's a video game, with a different eye and hand mm -hmm. later on. So if 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 we do if we show you a, a, a great video game that you play in an exhibition and, and you might know that video game. It might mm. be your favourite video game. I would really hope that you go back and there's something we have done that's made you go, oh, I didn't really notice that the controller is a really huge part of this and this has been pointed out to me or whatever. So, right. so, so yeah. have, having a criticality to mm. both production and consumption and I yeah. think peeling back that layer of the auteur and I think that's very, for me, been very important both in the Smithsonian context and powerhouse mm -hmm. design museums, design is a team sport, right? It's a team activity, you know, there's no blah, 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 all that stuff. But also now working in, in media that, you know, the auteur in film is, you know, it's like, I want to deconstruct all that. I want it like you, you this is like everyone else in the credits. That's what I, <laughs> that's what I love. But you as a viewer now, and I think that you as a viewer or you are a participant so much in this, particularly 
particularly from mobile on, onwards, mm. right? So the sort of sense of, of even the mass, you know, Disney, Marvel, cinematic universe is, is, is a massively designed experience and content. And everything is designed so that you as a viewer are a participant, even right down to like the, you know, the little name drops, the little what I would say, sample spotting, the sort of after credit sequence. It's all there for you to be part of the making of the bigger story, which is actually what that cinematic universe is, has been designed to be. So I'm kind of really interested in that sort of narrative uh, design and, and peeling back that both from a um, cultural sense, but also an economic and a sort of critical sense too of like, what does that do to how narratives become normalized and how politics gets transformed by it, how economics gets transformed by it, and, and how also we end up in a culture where it's this sort of fan battle of opinions, which is sort mm. of, you know, plays out in politics in terrible ways now. We're seeing sort of ridiculousness and sort mm. of, yeah, so, so sort of that, how all these things fit together. So I'm really interested in it sort of from that sociological viewpoint too and, and a sort of political economy of media, putting that out on the table more. And, of course, you, you can't do a, you can't upfront that in an exhibition ever because it's sort of like, oh, you're killing my great things. I just want to come and enjoy this. Yes, you will enjoy this. And, but when you will, through great design of an exhibition and the interactive experiences particularly, start to leave that museum experience questioning stuff. And we've designed that museum experience to be extremely satisfying and entertaining and a great family day and great social moment. But you leave leaving with these spiky questions, going, I'm not so sure about this anymore. Or I want to, like, this, the, the, like I use my lens, this thing we designed mm -hmm. for the museum yeah, yeah. visitor. I've collected these um, things and I, th I collected all the things I loved and now I go onto the website and log into it and it's recommending me all these things I've never heard of and I'm going to try one of those. For me, that yeah. is really when the museum succeeds because, you know, I, I, I sometimes, well, I often now talk about the best museums are curiosity machines. So they're machines that <laughs> nice. generate more curiosity. So a successful visit is when you are more curious at the end of it. You haven't, you know, we haven't satisfied you're not, your you're not seated. user mm. needs. You're not yeah, sated. Yeah. User needs mm. should never be satisfied in a museum. Yeah. It should be generated. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's nice. the sort of thing, right? So yeah, you mentioned the lens and obviously the Cooper Hewitt, what was it actually called? I, I think of it as a pen. It's called the pen. It's called the pen. Yeah, it was the pen. It was called the pen. So there's a there's a little service design brief. I don't do it actually anymore, but you used to do it as a kind of workshop brief to say, you know, a, about libraries mostly, but libraries and museums actually, which was, you know, we think of these places, you know, Acme is one of them hmm. and libraries are another of a place uh, where some stuff is kept in within four walls and you go there to kind of experience it. What happens if you think of it as a service that breaks out of the kind of those four walls, which of course is, is what you did. So um, do you want to briefly kind of talk about I, I guess there's a, there's an obvious through line from the kind of the pen to the lens, but also maybe describe what they are in case no one's sure. heard of them, but also, you know, how's it evolved? And, and the last thing is we can't avoid talking about COVID, right? Because obviously those four walls became inaccessible. Melbourne famously has had the longest lockdown in the world, which you're out of now, aren't you? I think. Yeah, we are. We are. Yeah. 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 Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So what was the sort of origins of that? Um, and then how's it evolved then in Acme? Sure. So, look, in 2011, I moved to New York to work with Bill Mogridge, who was then direct, director of the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. And Bill's sort of notion was, here's a museum in an Upper East um, Side mansion house in New York. It's part of the Smithsonian. How can it be a national design museum? Mm. And we're working with um, local projects, at then a fledgling uh, design studio in New York. And um, Jake Barton, the principal of local projects, was like, well, look, you know, you're really interested in this sort of sense of people taking objects home with them. What do designers use a pen? Let's give everybody a pen. And this was sort of a great idea. The concept was brilliant. It was amazing. It was at that moment that all the Kickstarter projects that were booming were physical things. So everyone was right. like, oh, I can go and manufacture stuff. Yeah. And of course, 99% of those Kickstarters got financed, but then couldn't actually deliver, it turns out. Yeah, they'll find it's too much, right? Manufacturing is really hard. <laughs> yeah. So 
you know, local projects, great idea. They worked on all the interactive elements of the museum then, the screen-based stuff. And um, uh, my team with a bunch of other people from GE and others um, worked on like, took this notion of like getting it manufactured. And, and, and we worked with a firm in Spain to design a stylus, uh, which it actually was a, a um, had used chips that they were actually using in an RFIA um, D wand that they were using in um, hospitals to oh. collect patient uh, details from wrist, wristbands. So we took that uh, circuit board and with um, the product designers from GE, who the GMO of GE was on the board, and yeah. she was like, you can have two days of our product design team. Come with this beautiful, slick thing. Yeah. It eventually got made, very, very hard, battery operated, all of those things. And it became this service kind of design challenge of like, okay, so you, you're going to have this wand in the museum. What does it do? How is it communicated to a visitor that it does what it does? And how actually well, the really important part of it was I come to this old mansion house on the Upper East um, side and I'm given this wand. And just that notion is so, was so counterintuitive that it broke through you know it was like yeah you know, like you're a 70 year old you've come to Andrew Carnegie's old house as a historic house you discover it's a designed museum and you're given a wand and you're like go do things with it. it's amazing if you're <laughs> 17 as uh, 17 if, you, uh, if you're a 17 year old kid you're like wow this is amazing too it's not my phone so yeah there was something about the physical design of it that was really seductive and it was really on brand for the new museum as a active design museum. It wasn't just a museum of decorative arts then. Mm. It was a museum that you did design at. And I think that was really, it, it just a beautiful mix of things coming uh, together at the right sort of moment. Uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies supported all of that, which was really, you know, again, it was about pitching this bold idea some prototypes and ex executing on it in a in a service kind of design way mm. rather than just a singular product. People could take home the things that they saw. It opened the collection up to many, many, many more people. So coming here to Melbourne, yeah, we're working with a museum now that that the exhibitions are about things that you have at home. It's not like a design museum where there are unique things that you probably don't have at home but you're interested in. We have things that you can go and watch on Netflix later or play on your PlayStation later mm. or, you know, ask someone else about. So so the, the things that already exist in a universe, in, in our cultural universe anyway, on the internet. So the lens also was a nice metaphor too, again, sort of the the name of the thing describes what it does. So lens allows you to look look closer at the things you're interested in. So that's a great thing for a museum to give a visitor. Um, and of course, you know, we worked with um, one of the local universities, Swinburne University, to make it recyclable. So the, the challenge with the pen was we had, you know, 3,000 made and mm. they were battery ran and you borrowed it. Yeah. The lens... You get, you keep. Oh, you, you take, take it home. home. Ah, you okay. take it home. It's, oh, recyclable. it's recyclable. Yeah. It's recyclable. It's biodegradable. It's beautiful. And that's the sort of secret sauce here because it's it's a souvenir as well. So yeah. even if you use it to collect things and you never log into it and it sits on your fridge, it's a beautiful object from the museum that's on your fridge yeah. that's a talking point. People are like, what's that? Oh, it's this lens. I went uh, to this museum of media in Melbourne. That was really amazing. So we, we learned a lot through those processes. And I think it's that sort of sense of, again, as the smartphone has become so much implicated in the rest of our lives and our work, mm. you know, the sort of sense of the museum as a space that might physically offer, you know, I, I, some, I sometimes use the notion from game kind of um, studies of the magic circle. If you step yeah, inside yeah. the magic circle of the game, what is the superpowers you get? And the lens gives you these superpowers that you don't get on your phone. Of course, you could do it on your phone. Of course, you could use you your phone to do exactly the same. And, and, of yeah, course you yeah. could. But I would always say you wouldn't because through user of research is that, you know, you might scan one or two QR codes and then someone will send you a great TikTok and you're out of your QR codes. You, you're yeah, not scanning you're out and scanning anymore. You're out of the magic circle, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of that 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 philosophy. And it's been it's 
it's been really successful. You know, I think we've been open for about 150 days now yeah. in between lockdowns and all the rest. People have collected more than two and a half million things in the museum. Like, like, like that, that's ridiculous. I feel like you should probably unpack what you mean by collect stuff and take it home. Because um, I know we've been talking yeah. about, and I know what you're talking about, but maybe just how does that, what's the mechanics of that? So what, what's happening there is that they're using the lens as an identifier as they move through the physical space and they're mm. touching museum labels and other sensors. And what, so what does the lens look like? It's because it's, I can see it on the lens is circle, a little mm -hmm. bit like a, um, a CD-ROM yeah, yeah. Uh, or a DVD, uh, but also yeah. it's, it's modeled in, on, in size. Mm. It's also modeled on that sort of notion of Viewmaster Reel. So it has that nice yeah. visual language to it. And you touch it on the museum labels and other sensors around uh, the museum. And what that's doing is obviously creating a database mm. record that connects your unique identifier, which is anonymized. We don't know it's mm -hmm. you specifically until you register it, which you don't have to do. And as you move through, you are building up a diary of things you have touched, which are the things you are interested in. And as you get to the end of the exhibition, there's an experience called the constellation, which is explicitly about using the things that you have found, collected, to connect you to thousands of other things that aren't machine generated, but have been curated by our curators. So you might have collected nice. the Mad Max car, and our curators go, well, we have connected that to The Ring, the Japanese horror film The Ring, and we've connected The Ring to this great video game that you haven't heard of yet. And you can also collect those right. too. And so it's just sort of building this media library that you become personally acquainted with through your physical actions. And that was another thing we learned from the pen experience was this sort of memory piece that when you're physically doing something with more of your body mm. to collect things, you remember it better. It's like writing yeah, yeah. notes by hand. And it's that physical memory piece. It's sort of, again, pushing back for museum of screen yeah. culture. It's kind of interesting that we're using a not, a not screen to do that collecting. And again, it's, you know, points at the materiality of media and, you know, all those sort of nice riffs you can do on this sort of stuff. The physicality thing is is a kind of interesting bit of the magic, I think, because as I understand it, with the pen, you used to connect, collect, it, and then you got a yeah. you got a code, right? When you went back and you you got a put it into it the website, yeah, and then you got your stuff. yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah, assuming, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, well, there was a piece I did. Um, uh, I worked with Brendan Dawes on something, and uh, it was I have to be a little bit careful about what I talk about here. Uh, it was this way to kind of collect like a kind of diary of uh of sort of patient uh, patient suffering with a certain kind of cancer and it was a kind of this whole thing we kind of built and it, it kind of collected some of their kind of feelings and, and thinking about it and it was interesting it was this mm. idea of kind of doing research into people's lives but at the same time turning it into something that's actually kind of, you know a really difficult moment but it's also kind of a, a sort of beautiful thing and one of the things that bren uh, did was then you ended up with this kind of disc. That's what made me think of it, but it, um, mm. just on the screen, right? And that was kind of all your stuff. We took all the sort of, you could sketch and things and all the line marks and then these text you wrote, you end up in this kind of spiral. And uh, then he said, well, gonna, he then printed these out and um, had like a kind of little sort of podium that you could then um, put these things on, these discs on. So you could take them off the shelf. They were the size of a mime. I'm doing this on screen. Of course, no one's going to see this. They were um, <laughs> bigger than an LP. You know, they were kind of uh, uh, about the size yeah, of a hubcap wow. or something like that. You would take them off of the shelf, put them on this thing, and it would play that person's record. And, of course, all it was is an wow. RFID in, in the back of the, the disc yeah, yeah, and triggering yeah. the kind of thing. But there was some kind of magic there that even though you know how it works, this sense of my stuff is contained in this physical item, you know, even though it's yeah. just a, you know, yeah. a code that's yeah. triggering, you know, and entering yeah. the database. Yeah. And there is definitely something um, still, I think, quite, you know, you talked about the magic circle, you know, there is something quite kind of um, magical about those kind of physical digital crossovers, which I guess is kind of the, uh, the center of everything you're doing really in, in the museum. Yeah. 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 It's very important. I mean, I think, think that, and we see that also with, you know, even the way that people print photo books of their digital mm. photos. People, you know, like it's sort of a, there's this very strong cultural urge to make physical yeah. things and, and physical things as memory devices is, you know, thousands of years old. And that's, that's really, that's what we're working with rather than against. And I think it's that, that sort of sense of how might you use that to also push out 
into a broader networked public as well and 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 to push that piece further so so you know um uh, so people's experience with the museum extends far beyond their moment in the gallery itself and the gallery is almost a trigger for a cultural change around what they're interested in how they choose to watch what they watch what they choose what to play and it keeps them coming back to this notion of the museum is the museum has opinions and the museum is more than just a repository of stuff yeah. because of course it's more than a repository of stuff but it's also it should be more as i often say it's more than a family day out too if it's just a family day out you're competing with every public park and every other thing in yeah. the city and i think it's 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 different yeah. right yeah and you have a kind of different mandate as well i guess as well that there is that educational yeah. part to it yeah. but educational without capital yeah, yeah. no i get it, I get it. Without the, the, the germans say in a finger hawk they're like the, the, your, the index finger raised <laughs> kind of kind of education of like yeah. so how did covid you know affect your world i mean not your personally but you're the world of museums and presumably you're kind of plugged into a kind of wider community as well mm. um and you talked about you know museums some museums had digital strategies some kind of didn't some at least most of them now but you know they've gone from here's our web page with what's on to here's our web page with what's on and you can buy tickets to sort of something more complex in some cases and sometimes not it's sort of kind of stayed that way so um yeah how did covid then affect all of that did it sort of I think it accelerated a lots of things like like it, it it accelerated a lot of things that were already there that were both perhaps positive trends so, so it's this move towards figuring out what digital meant in a museum got got massively accelerated like digital transformation in every other sector mm. the other thing it accelerated though was also a reckoning with all the other problems in the museums um you know colonialism representation mm. staff structures, all of those things. So there's been a big shift, and I think particularly in the US, we've seen a big push finally towards unionisation of workers mm. in museums, like some really significant changes, which we've seen in other sectors too. And uh, just a reckoning of like, what are they for? Like, what is a museum for? I think for the, you know, certainly through my career in museums, museums have become, you know, for up until maybe 2015, 2017, you know, sort of civic places that renewed cities so we'll build a new museum because that's going to attract the creative mm -hmm. class and all that yeah. sort of you know and cultural tourism and all blah 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 blah. but that sort of didn't address what the museum could be for it was like well the museum is a could be something more and i think the the period of covid certainly created a lot of reflection within the sector about who are museums for and what value do they deliver? What values should they deliver? And, and and those things I think are really healthy. But as I said at the start, you know, I think we have lost a lot of amazing people mm. from the field who are in the great re resignation in the yeah. US have gone, look, this is just not, you know, change is too slow. Has that also swept through the culture sector as well? Definitely, yeah. d definitely. C certainly the sense that change is too slow and too hard. And I think, you know, we've... Um, when I left New York at the end of 2015, you know, I was writing about what I'd realised there. And one of the big things I realised working with American museums and inside American museums was the financial structure that makes them operate is not representative of the communities who come to right. them. So the person walking in the door is not the people financing the museum. So I've previously worked in Australia where museums are financed predominantly by the state. So there is at least some sense of the citizenry have, having a responsibility to this sense of a public. Yeah. If an American um, museum, it's usually the board that finances it and, and philanthropists, and, and they are not the people who visit. So the users of the service are not the funders of the service in, in, in any way. And, and sometimes they have very counter motivations. Yes, yeah. We've just seen that in the, with the Science Museum in the UK, right? Um, where they are um, yes. sponsored, one of the big sponsors is Shell, and there was a um, pair of scientists yeah, who just said, "No, you can't that, use our work uh, because we don't we don't agree with you." you that's know, right. Gagging yeah. us because there's like a gagging order from the from the well, a gagging order. This you know written into the sponsorship contract tract is nothing that can disparages our industry. So you know, science museum can't be critical of a fossil fuel company. That's a problem, right? 
It's it's a huge problem, and I think those there, there are so many of those that don't get to the level of public mm. awareness throughout every museum that doesn't have a strong connection with their with their publics, and I think that's the piece that you know a lot of this sort of human centered work that my teams have worked mm. on for many years now has been about reorienting and renegotiating a social contract with the visitor. So, you know, both the pen mm. and the lens, you know, in many ways is about saying you should expect the museum to give you something more than a great day yeah, out. I, yeah. you, I mean, if you come to this museum now, you should, you know, if you're a, if you're a parent, you, sh you should expect us to recommend you amazing video games for your kids to play or yourself to yes. play, in fact. And you should expect us to have some opinions about great television mm. series or terrible ones that you might watch ironically. <laughs> and why would you do that? Or, yeah. you know, how things are made or whatever, you know. Like it's sort of that social contract piece at, at the heart of that design philosophy, mm. for want of a better word, you know, I sort of, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's um a thing i can imagine a lot of people listening despite all of the kind of pains and all the troubles you just were just describing just now it's a um it's also kind of really nice design space to work in because of that kind of sense of purpose or that philosophy you know i can imagine it at least you know makes the difficulties and the hard work feel worthwhile it's very very rewarding and i think you know it's 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 such a privilege and a luxury really mm -hmm. to be able to work in the sort of work that i get to do because it's always changing and it isn't purely transactional yeah. and i think it's that sense of being able to push beyond transactions and to be able to poke at some of those things around friction you know a, a lot of what we're trying to do is introducing friction into services mm -hmm. rather than designing it out yeah. of services yeah. so it's sort of pushing back on some of the things that you know when i often speak to product kind of designers mm -hmm. or you know others who are like well we're trying to what how kind of did you shave milliseconds off this or how did you make this a very smooth process it's like well we did this but then we brought in this great friction because the friction is what makes it memorable yeah. And we make the friction delightful friction, I guess. So it's sort of trying to create texture mm. and spikiness, you know. I think it's it's the yeah. DJ. There's a level in, in intentionality it's the there, DJ, you know. Totally. It really is no of kind of like yeah. oh, yeah. I'm going to kind of shape the the cadence and the energy and respond to that of the audience. Exactly. Hey, look, exactly. we're coming well up exactly. to time, um, and we haven't even talked about <laughs> NFTs, which I'm kind of glad about. As you know, the show is named after the Rand Charles Eames film, Powers of Ten. It's all about the relative size of things in the universe. So the, the final question is, what one small thing either exists and is kind of overlooked and underappreciated or uh, could be redesigned um, that would have an outsized or does have an outsized effect on the world? I, I mean, I would have to say it would be sound. Mm. I think we underappreciate the impact of sound in space. Mm. We, we all feel and experience it, but we don't understand it in its physiological, emotional and memory sense. And I think there's a lot in design of sound in yeah. space, ser service and product that we, we just don't hear. Yeah. And I, I, I think museums also just, museums struggle with sound. We never yes. get it right. And... It's the one thing I'm, I'm determined I've got to figure out. Well, that was the big problem when all those meteorite installations entered the museum, right? There was this cacophony and I was like, can oh, you yeah. turn that down? I said, no, it's part yeah. of the art. And um, yeah, and then yeah. the web happened. And as you, for those of us who were in the sort of CD-ROM, the sort of multimedia days and then moved over to the web, it suddenly went silent, right? Because the, the bandwidth wasn't there. It went anymore. silent for so yeah, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, look, thank you so much for being my guest on Power of 10. Where can people find you online? Um, they can find me at fresh and kind of new.org and that has all the links to all the other things, private, public, professional. Okay. I'll put it all in the show notes. Well, good luck with all the rest of it. And, uh, thank you so much for being my guest. Thanks heaps. It's been great fun. As I'm sure you're aware, you've been listening to Power of 10. My name is Andy Pullane. You can find me at apolane on Twitter opalane.com where you can find more episodes and sign up for my newsletter doctor's note if you like the show please take a moment to give it a rating on itunes it really helps others find us and as always get in touch if you have any comments feedback or suggestions for guests all the links are in the show notes thanks for listening and see you next time